Welcome, everyone, for this week's Rising Tide Foundation lecture, where we are continuing our explorations on the topic of science unshackled. Uh, we've had a lot of very, very interesting presentations that are addressing certain heretical uh, concepts, like uh, causality, <laughs> which is a uh, sort of forbidden in uh, many respected corridors of scientific discussion, which is, I think, a big reason why there's uh, an inability of humankind to make the sorts of discoveries we should have been making already for many generations. And there's the, these, these, there are necessary, sometimes there are necessary obstacles and then sometimes there are unnecessary obstacles to the human mind's ability to leap beyond the limits to the limits to growth, the limits of knowledge and make new Eurekas and transform those new Eurekas in the form of new technologies that make life better for people that allow us to have more opportunities to explore our metaphysical, our artistic, our aesthetic uh, senses of identity. And of course, we all know that there are certain political aspects to this, but in the course of this series, uh, we are really looking at matters of causality and certain questions that are just so rich. And uh, and it's a shame that so few people have an opportunity to address them. Last week, Dr. Place had uh, graced us with um, a wonderful presentation on the concept of action at a distance and the, the various fallacious and fruitful concepts of space um, that have been shaping much of, of the last centuries, if not millennia, of human scientific discourse and the battles over the nature of reality. So I think that this week's presentation is going to complement that in a nice way, which is going to deal now with time, but of course not time by itself, but Michael Claridge has thought about matters of time that things that we take all for granted a little bit too much. Um, so I don't know what we're what what's going to happen, but I'm going to learn as well. And so, like usual, with if everyone could put their names in the chat box, and I'll call upon you in queue once the the main presentation is over, we'll have I'm sure a very good discussion. And Michael, it is all yours. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Is the uh, audio okay? Oh yeah, cool. And uh, if if you put my screen on a full screen, can you read this, everybody? Yes. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I'm continually inspired by your and Cynthia's, uh, it seems, indefe indefatigable inde indefatigable efforts. So <laughs> thank you for having me on once again. Yeah. So time and why should we, why should we try to change our conception or perception of time? And a friend of mine turned me on to this from Plato. To become a spectator of time is cure for meanness of soul. Uh, and I thought that was a good starting point. The discussion of time is so rich and so difficult that I'm going to be uh, using physics as a springboard because uh, one could wander all over the place. And I will do a, I will do enough wandering if we even with it with that limitation. So that's always, I'm going to be starting from physics and, uh, yeah, and broadening to the conceptions of time. I've had uh, my share of different experiences of time, of time not being linear, of uh, passing time not existing at all. Uh, so, it, um, and I know a lot of other people have too. Uh, and so I'm, I'm starting from that as real, uh, as, as I'm trusting my experiences in that. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, only partly theoretical and also partly based upon my experience. Let's start. Okay, so that is a way to write that the position of something is a function of its velocity. And we put this variable called time into the velocity. And then we have some starting point, right? So if this was a hundred meter dash, maybe we put our, our rulers starting here. So that's a zero, because that's the starting of our hundred meters, right? And then uh, if we know the velocity of the runner, then we just put in the time and it gives us the position of the runner. Right. One uses formulas like this so often as a physicist, uh, and they start, you know, in high school 
or certainly college when you start thinking about it. And uh, and uh, the more I the more I thought about it, I it started to sink into me that this. So this is I don't know if we should call it a law, but we can certainly you know say it's a law of physics. This sort of statement. And what's notable when one uh, after a while is that there's no present moment in this. The laws of physics don't tell us when now is. We are free to choose a now. That's one thing. But that's very different than the law itself telling us that there is a preferred moment in time called now. In fact, yeah, you don't need that at all for the, for the formulas. Another attribute of these simple formulas is they don't say anything about how quickly time moves or goes forward. And that's a really, that's a really wild one because I'll go into this later. We have a, all of us as biological beings have a perception or a sense or something of, of time, whatever this time is, right? whatever, moving, you know, it's going forward. Uh, and yet there is absolutely nothing in the formulas that dictates anything about that. And the two kind of go together, the two things I just said. Uh, so I'll just put them here. So A, there's no present. And by that, I mean, you know, this experience of now doesn't exist in there. And B, uh, there's no rate. Maybe I'll say no rate of time. Now, of course, I, I mean, I understand you can say, well, you can't define a rate without time. So it's in the definition. I know all that, but I'm just trying to paint a picture here of, uh, of what's inherent in this. Now, I would, I would, I would propose that, some, uh, that all of us have had some experience of this, maybe along the lines of you, you probably have woken up sometimes in a bed and you, or maybe in a car, right? Or a hotel or something, and you have no perception of what day it is or what time it is. And that's exactly kind of what's inherent in here. And it's so uh, agitating. It's so agitating. We we scramble to get ourselves, what day is it? I got to figure out what day it is. What time is it? I've got to figure out what time it is, right? And where am I? Uh, and so I'm proposing that an experience like that is a it's a real experience. It doesn't need to be dismissed or, uh, or or gotten out of as soon as possible. It's an experience of a different relationship to time than our usual relationship. Another attribute of these simple statements is there's nothing in there about the past disappearing or the future not existing yet. So our senses, which we are all very glued to, our senses show us that five minutes ago is no longer here. It has disappeared, right, somewhere. Uh, has it gone to the left or to the right? <laughs> you know, where has five minutes ago, ago gone? Uh, and so to the, the senses, just repeating myself, sh tell us that it's gone. But there's nothing in the physics laws that says it's gone. And I would propose that that is a more accurate statement of the situation. The past doesn't go anywhere. It's just as real or just as... Uh, yeah, just as real as right now is. And the same could be said of the future. Future's a little more murky, right? Uh, what does Yoda say? The future always in motion is. Uh, so, um, but but uh, but just to point out again that the that the physical laws don't say anything about the future not existing yet. In fact, there's a whole branch of mechanics that looks at uh, what's sometimes referred referred to as an action principle. Uh, where, uh, like if you throw a ball, I throw a ball into the air. And so I'm here, let's see if I can see my, yeah, you can see that low. I'm here and I throw my ball in the air and the ball lands and bang on the ground. 
you there's a whole argument to be made and it's beautiful mathematics that was worked out i forget exactly when late 17 early 1800s where the way that you the way that you learn what trajectory the ball travels in is you have to assume that the entire trajectory exists you don't assume that the ball is moving along the trajectory you assume that the whole trajectory exists and then nature wants to what's called minimize the action wants to do the least amount of work is a colloquial way to say it uh, in order to get the ball from here to there and I remember in graduate school being taught like, well, it, but it's just it's just a way of looking at the problem because we all know that the ball travels, right? And the more I thought about it, I'm like, well, maybe not. Maybe that approach to these problems is simply looking at it from a different perspective of time. From one perspective of time, the ball actually travels. From another perspective of time, the entire trajectory exists all together all at once. Now, in terms of the rate uh, that time flows, we've most of us have had some experience, or uh, or you've certainly heard of these experiences under moments of, of danger, uh, emergency, car crashes. <laughs> uh, you can be bounced into a different rate of flow of time, where everything the usual you know statement is everything was going in slow motion. You know, I saw. I saw the car start to tip. I saw the pocketbook slowly go into the air. And so many people have had these uh, experiences in one form or another that I think what we what we have to, I'm suggesting what we, what we try to acknowledge is that our usual sense of time and the flow of time is, is um, based upon the biology. It's based upon the metabolism. That's our usual experience of time. And a, a creature like a mouse, you know, it breathes, I think about 20 times, 40 times faster than we do. I forget the exact number. Uh, and all of its, uh, all of its uh, neuro, all of its neurology is, is also 40 times faster. And there's a lot of research that goes into this, uh, but I've noticed in that research, there's often some assumption that, well, but, but the mouse must experience life as passing quickly. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, the mouse does not think it's living quickly, right? The mouse, I'm sure if we could go, you know, it has the same experience of walking around and whatnot as we do. And then when it looks at us, it sees these very slow moving creatures and it looks and it goes, wow, they must experience time really slowly, right? And the biology, yeah, so I'm our usual sometimes connected to the biology, these moments of danger where our consciousness gets, you know, knocked free, uh, uh, literally knocked free from the biology, our consciousness then can experience a different rate of the flow of time. So again, just to tie it back, I'm, I, I'm starting with that the physics says nothing about it. There is no preferred rate of flow of time. And then I'm bringing that to some experiences a lot of us have had, how that might be true. And so you can, you can entertain the idea that our awareness uh, is not fixed to any particular present moment or any particular rate of flow of time. However, our experience, our usual experience as educated adults who, who believe their senses implicitly, right? Why would I doubt my senses? Our usual experience is, is not that. It's quite different, right? We, we always experience a present moment and we always experience time flowing at a usual rate. So why would why would we want to why would you want to ponder this? Well, there's a, coming back to the, the Plato quote, there is, there is a, when one is, is only living in the senses, one's life can get pretty um, anxious and hurried because the moment is always passing. We call it passing time sometimes. It's always passing and everything, my whole existence, everything that I, 
am or or could be, we, we, we try to force it into this present moment, which is passing all the time. And I, 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 I my experience is it creates a lot of uh, unhappiness, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. So that alone could be enough worth the price of admission, right? Why should I change my relationship for time? Well, maybe I would like to have more experiences of not living an anxious or hurried life. Okay, now we're gonna switch. We're gonna switch. Not as good of an eraser as I would plan to be. Uh oh. Switch to green. Okay, in the in the eighteen hundreds, uh, those uh, gases were studied for a long time, uh, and, uh, starting with with Boyle and. Uh, Hook and other people. And then in the 1800s, the mathematics of, of this model, this, of this model that gases are made of atoms or molecules, right? And we're, we want to try to explain gases, the behavior of gases, by this model that we have these little tiny particles, which we cannot see. Hmm, that's a tricky one. We can't see, um, but we're going to assume things like they have a distribution of velocities. And then we're going to try to explain all the laws of uh, how gases behave. It's fun sometimes to go back and read. I read a few uh, uh, kind of commentaries or editor notes uh, when, the, when, when the mathematics was being presented. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to say that I'm going to build a theory on something you can't see, that you can never see, right? That's a little bit of a challenge to, it, to accept that. Well, what I want to bring... Uh, Yes, so I'm sorry. So that proposal that I am basing my physics on a something, in this case molecules, that I will never be able to sense with my senses ever. You could, it's just not in the, you know, not in the ballgame. And probably never even observe with an instrument. Okay, once you take that leap, then you are in the in a world that does not have to agree with what my sense-based reality shows me. And it, yeah, it doesn't have to be, make, it doesn't have to make sense. Uh, and so you, you get these, uh, you get these strange pictures that are painted in the mathematics and they start, they called them ensembles. You had to come up with the idea of an ensemble of gas particles. So what does that mean? So in my room right here, right now, I have the model that, um, that is filled with molecules, right? And they're zipping around and there's a distribution of velocities, et cetera, et cetera. And I might think I could build a theory on that and say, I can calculate the pressure in the room, the volume in the room, uh, the speed of sound in the room, et cetera, et cetera, simply by proposing that, but you can't. <laughs> what you actually you know, what you actually have to do is propose that there are an infinite number of rooms not just this, not just this room right here that my senses tell me, but this one and another room that's in the same place at the same time, which has a different distribution of molecules, and another one that's in the same room somehow. The math doesn't tell you how it's possible, but it's in the same room, and it also has a distribution of molecules and velocities, and and then you then you can then you can derive all the properties of gases with your model. And again, this, this caused a lot of consternation with a lot of physicists because they're like, well, that's a stupid thing. Who would believe that statement? That's a stupid thing. But another, another take on it is, no, the physics is showing you some aspect of reality once you abandon the senses. Once you abandon the senses, the requirements of the senses, you're in this world of possibilities that in order to explain what I see here and now, I have to assume that there's many different versions of here and now, even though my senses don't show it to me. And that is very exciting. That's really exciting stuff. Uh, and you might, uh, you might see, for those of you who learned a little quantum mechanics, where this is heading. Okay, and I'll get there very soon. But I wanted to talk about like, what could this, what, can we see any, can we see any manifestations of this that are maybe off the, off the statistical mechanics 
textbook page, right? So what, what, what's some way to get a handle on this? And uh, I'm in this beautiful forest here, uh, visiting some friends and uh, walking around and I'll go up on a big hilltop and I over there and I look down over this giant valley. And there's not just one pine tree, right? Nature doesn't do it that way. When I look down in the valley, I see like every possible version of a pine tree that nature can create. Now, if I look at any an oak tree, well, I don't just see one oak tree. I see this version and that version and this version and that version. And that's an inherent attribute of living in a sense-based world where you experience passing time that you don't, you, you can't see just one example of a thing in nature. You must see millions of examples of whatever it is. You're looking at stars, planets, cells, trees. Uh, that's, that's inherent in that limitation. If we could abandon the senses, then we might see that there's really just one thing called an oak tree. It, it exists in this other dimension of time, which I think Plato would refer to as eternity. It exists in this eternity. The, the oak tree exists in eternity. It's only when I try to squeeze, you know, try to push at that single thing of an oak tree, only when I, when I force it into this world of senses and passing time, that it splits into all these different versions of an oak tree. Another way to, uh, to see this is to take it more personally and um, so I, how do I put this? One way it was put long ago is that um, anything that I see in another person from the most selfless love to the meanest, cruelest actions, it doesn't matter what it is, anything, any attribute that I see in another person is also in me. Uh, you can't have a single person that is just unified. Uh, and so this, this, once one can work with that, and no matter what I might judge somebody else for, doesn't even matter, it truly does not matter what it is. I have some element of that in myself simply because I am a single created being and I live in this thing called passing time. If I can get out of that, if I can put myself intentionally in this other physical dimension where everybody has everything, because that's the only way you can make people, it can, from my own experience, and I've certainly heard it from others, it can lower this sense of isolation and judgment that I have towards other people. So it's not, it's it's hard maybe to say that this is time directly, but like I said, I'm using how physics has progressed uh, to shed some light on how, uh, how we might change how we see things. Now, the same is true of... Uh, of all molecular matter. So gases are molecules, but inside of our cells, there's a bunch of molecules, right? We all have all these incredible biochemical explanations. It's it, it's hard, how do I put it? You can't, it's hard to pin, I, you can't find a single uh, insulin molecule in a single cell. There's too many cells and there's too many insulin molecules. So it's the same problem we have that we can't really pin down individuals when we look at the world this way. There's this general class of things called insulin. Now that's when we look at them. I bet an insulin molecule by itself knows it's, a, it's an individual, but we can't see that. Okay. Now, whoops, I don't want them on the races. This is the third and last physics topic on this. So the, the thoughts about ensembles of gas molecules that were developed in the late 1800s rolled right into the quantum mechanics in the 1920s. Uh, and people were trying a bunch of different ways to make this work, right? I wish sometimes 
right, to be able to go back there and hear all the different things. But that all gets kind of wiped away. And then we just say there's Heisenberg and there's Schrodinger, right? Uh, but the Heisenberg and Schrodinger Dirac methods work, uh, were the ones that work and could be applied easily. And they all they all assumed this. So what does that mean? All possibilities actualized. When I'm when I am relating to uh, a quantum mechanical thing like an electron or a photon, I'm not talking about, not talking about relating to a, a desk or another person necessarily. But when I look at a piece of light or an electron, I'm never going to see the single one. What? But any any behavior that it has can only be explained if I assume in my math that that electron is living out all of its possibilities all at once. Okay, so what's an example of this that could help? Um, if I had a room that had a blue wall and a red wall, And then I had my candle here, oops, <laughs> like that, and uh, or light source, any light source is good, right? And then I have my detector, which I'm gonna draw as an eye, right? So that the detector is the eye. And we do one of these things, and you can, people have done this experiment thousands of times, okay? And if you, if you know the experiment I'm gonna talk about, you might have some disagreements with how I'm presenting it, and that's fine, we can talk about it. Uh, okay, so what you notice is that sometimes you see a piece of light goes in, I should draw it green. Piece of light leaves the candle, and then a blue photon hits your eye. So you're like, oh, that, that bounced off the blue wall. Okay, cool, no problem. You also sometimes see that the piece of light goes off, and you detect a red photon. You're like, cool, that bounced off the red wall, okay? But a certain fraction of the time, you see a color which I don't have here, uh, you see a purple piece of light. And the only way a purple piece of light can be created is that if it bounces off both of them and then combines at your eye. If it bounced off the blue light, the, the blue wall first and headed over to the red wall, it would be absorbed, right? Because the red wall only reflects red light. So if a piece of light went off the blue wall and then landed at the red wall, you wouldn't see purple. And the same the other way, if, if it bounced off the red wall, you might say, well, then it went to the blue wall, right? And then it came to your eye. No, because the blue wall is going to absorb it, right? So the only way you can get the purple is if the red and the blue photon, if the light traveled both to both walls at the same time, it actualized both possibilities. It's not a theoretical thing. It's not a what if thing. You have to assume that it actually traveled to both walls and then to your eye. Of course, this causes great consternation and many uh, Many physicists will still say, yeah, it's just a model. You know, it's, it can't really be true. We just don't understand yet why it works, because obviously that can't be true. But I tend to, to believe what the, what the physics is saying. I really do. And it, 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 we, I can't explain how it comes about that way, but, I, but, it, but it is true that it works that way. Another way to put the, or an additional part of this is it's it's not possible for us to observe a piece of light before it gets to its destination. Okay, if you try to observe it, like say I'm shining at the wall, and if I okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to quickly put in a note card right in between, right? Well, as soon as I put that note card right in between, I will see the piece of light. And the only way I can explain how the light got there is to assume that it traveled everywhere in the room all at once. It traveled every single possible path, every single set of reflections in the whole room and landed right where I put that note card. So then bringing it to ourselves individually, um, yeah. it's a, it's a let's, let's propose that it's a cosmic truth. Uh, 
so then how would it apply to us? Um, you know, where do we land <laughs> after having actualized all of our possibilities? And I would say, well, we haven't landed at death because death is how one life ends, right? One life ends in a death. So what could I possibly be talking about when I say we land somewhere after actualizing all possible lives? I don't have an easy answer for that, but I'm trying to bring us to like, wow, like that's the kind of question that we can ask if we look at the physics about ourselves and time. Okay, I'm gonna end with a religious example. Okay. So 2,000 years ago, when, when new ideas, new possibilities were being unleashed on the earth in Palestine, uh, some of, a lot of those ideas were uh, preserved, categorized, codified, right? And so in the first few hundred years after Christ, um, the church was actually very doing a very good job, very concerned about passing on a lot of these ideas that were newly formulated, let's say, uh, at that time. Um, and people would travel from all over, uh, on Easter usually, right? You would travel all from all over, you'd go to one of the seven main centers um, and you would spend weeks there. You would spend weeks going to classes, <laughs> uh, talking to people, watching demonstrations, physical demonstrations, watching um uh, uh we call them plays now like uh dramas but i don't think they were different than what we're familiar with uh as ways to learn these ideas and so this is one of these ideas that was preserved and uh i don't know exactly but i think you probably have several days or maybe a week or something on just this one idea uh that was introduced at that time uh and so I'll just read it. So Gloria, Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, Sicut Erat in Principio, et Nunc, et Semper, et in Secula Seculorum. There's a One typo. Of the meanings of this is relevant to today's lecture. This one of the ways to read this is a uh, a summary of time. Of 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 uh, the new the new ideas of time or or the newly formulated ideas of time uh, that were unleashed then. I'm going to skip the first part, and I'm going to go right to the time part. Okay, so in English we could say, well, so glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it is in principle. Now, often in English that gets translated as as it was in the beginning. But that puts a that puts a past tense on it and completely mistranslates the word that you know principio. So this is more like as it is in principle, and in principle there is there is no time at all. It's a it's it's completely outside of time, right? So there's an element of existence, human existence, that isn't even in time. Okay, at nunc means now. We all have an experience of now. So now is the dimension of time. I, I would say it's a point. It's a point in time is now. Semper uh, is also very 
poorly translated, as I'm sure many of you know, into English. And, and But the bad translation started centuries ago in all languages. So semper doesn't mean an infinite, infinitely long period of time, right? Semper is a different dimension of time. And the, there's a couple of analogies with the physics that I was talking about. So one analogy is, remember I was talking about if you throw the baseball, you can look at the entire trajectory as existing all at once. Okay, there's no, there's no, there's no passing of anything. It just all exists all at once. So that's one way to connect with it, with, with modern ideas. Semper is a dimension of time where all the moments exist. They just all exist. They don't pass. They don't come towards you. They don't recede from you. They all exist all together. And then the last one, secu in secula seculorum, uh, secula refers to uh, a world or a cosmos or an eon. It's hard to, it's hard to put one uh, rendering of it. And this, this says that this new, this new teaching that was unleashed is true in all these realms. And it's also true in the world of all possible worlds. It's one rendition of this. It's true in time has an attribute where things exist in the world of all possible worlds. And this was something that was, you know, studied, studied, studied. It got codified, got put into the mass. You hear it, I think, 19 times in the old Latin mass, right? This is an enormous part of, uh, of the teachings uh, that can be found here. And there's, I, I found great, I meditated on this for a long time, probably a year, and uh, going over it and, and forcing my mind and other parts of me to work through that these are all dimensions of time had a pretty profound effect on, uh, on how I experience things day to day. I mean, mostly I'm living here. You know? I'm still mostly, I'm mostly shopping in now, right? But it, it has helped to broaden, uh, broaden the perspective. Um, so that's it. That's, that's my lecture for today. So I'll, I'll stop there and Matt, you can negotiate questions. Yeah, I, uh, that, that's good. No, your, your, uh, your presentations are always sure to, to offer a lot of good kindling for the fires of the mind. This is good. There's a lot, a lot you've given us here. Um, the, the people have already started raising their digital hands and putting their names in to ask you questions or share thoughts. So I'll, I'll, I'll withhold some of my questions and, and maybe I'll, I'll let them bubble to the surface a little bit later, but I'll, I'll uh, give over uh, the platform to Susie to ask the first question. Susie, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Yep. Okay, so Michael, now read what you have on the whiteboard Yes. in English without the explanation. Very good. Breaking Glory it up. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it is in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Oh, well, I guess I wanted you to read it with your better definition. There we go. Okay, yes. Okay, so glory be to the three principles of creation as they are in principle, as they are right now, as they are in the perpetual existence of all moments of time beautiful <laughs> beautiful oh my gosh and in the world of all possible worlds actualized oh too yummy yummy is right yeah and i can't you know so i get I think the proposals being, I can't understand time or myself or my possibilities unless I include all this. I'm always going to be looking at things too partially unless I can bring in this full range. Full range. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying that you spent a year meditating on that, yeah. it undoes so much of the fragmentation and the compartmentalization that this system has done to our mind and heart. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. 
well, what I did was I, I prayed the rosary for a year in 2020 when everything was going to hell, right? I, uh, I got a strong message, let's just say, that was uh, uh, pick up this thing, which you used, you know, 37 years ago. And, uh, and so that's what started it. And for about a year, every day, you know. Hmm. So you say this uh, five times in, or six times during the rosary, you say this. Yeah, the, the Mozart's treatment of of this in his Vespers is also a really great uh, bridging of the finite and the infinite as well, as far as really demonstrating a, an immortal piece of of beauty in the context of a of a finite life, right? That that he knew he was living, but was touching on something greater. Did so, you put that as the intro when you put this recording online? Yeah, I can do that. Awesome. Yeah. Sure. Done. Done. <laughs> All right, uh, Bruce. Michael, thank you for that. And the beautiful way you explained it. And it reminded me how much I enjoy the idea that everything is always happening eternally. And this is after reading a great amount of quantum physics as presented to lay people and also a lot of spiritual and Eastern texts and a lifetime of pondering these things. Everything's always happening along the lines of one of the models you gave. Mm -hmm. So that might just be saying what you've said in its own way. What about this idea that as we are right now, uh, loving and trusting and feeling safe, which gives that to all we touch and effect and if reality is a seamless and eternal one influencing all even things in what we would call the past what do you think about that i think it's absolutely right yeah and, and i would I, I i i'm sure that at some level it's happening uh mechanically if that's the right word it's just happening because of how the universe is constructed and I also know that there's another degree to which it can be happening when when I'm aware when I'm aware that it's happening that there's something else that gets uh, there's some other uh, forces that get introduced into it all. Nice, thank you. Yeah, Maureen, are you still there? That took a while. Um, I have a one comment. And oh, but have you, a, you have to speak really loud because your voice is very faint. Is or it, find your okay. microphone. Let me see if I can increase volume. Yeah. Uh, or just shout. Now? Okay, I'll <laughs> shout. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you can you hear? Can you hear Mike? I can hear, so just go for it. We okay. can repeat the question if we need to. Okay. Um, the first is a comment. The second is part of this comment is directed to Dr. Kwan. Uh, and the third part of it is, can somebody give me an explanation for a concept? Uh, okay, the first part is, if I can recall more or less correctly, um, David Bohm said that reality is divided into three domains. Uh, one is the expl explicate order, which is the solid world. The other one is the implicate order, which is the quantum world or objective reality. And the third order is the super implicate world, which is one consciousness. It's the idea, as one as well as one could put it, of God. So you could also say that the implicate order is linear thinking that no, the, the, the explicate excuse order? Me, that, ex, that the yeah. explicate order is linear right. thinking yeah. that the implicate order is a simultaneity of times i think einstein used that concept as well yeah. uh, within that would be the universal time reversal function which by the way i don't understand 
uh, that would be my question. And the other one would be the super uh, implicate would be beyond thinking as we know it, a different domain of thinking, if you want to call it yeah. uh, a under a uh, intuitive best word I can put for a oneness with the creator. So my one thing is the concept of um, time reversal, uh, which I believe was a concept that was used in describing the piece of Westphalia. But my question to Quan is, you could take these three orders basically and superimpose them on your epistemological journey as you're defining Plato. So except that you are going to have your super implicate order, which could be if you wanted to take that epistemological journey one step further, could be the domain of the philosopher king, which would be, again, another step. So I'm just throwing that out to you. And that's all I have to say. And now I'll go to mute. Well, before you go to, well, either way, uh, so the, in terms of Bohm's ideas, I haven't really studied him that much in many years, so I, I can't speak so directly. What you said with the three orders of reality sounds more like the top statement here. Um, if I had to draw some connection to, to what we were talking about today. Um, but the time reversal, I was debating whether or not to put that in. There's an, you know, let me uh, try to put it down here again to remind us. And that's the position of something as a function of its velocity. We put in this thing called time. Maybe it starts somewhere at the beginning when we start our watches. There's nothing in the laws that tells you what direction time goes. <laughs> and again, some people are like, well, that's just an artifact. You know, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, yeah, don't worry about that. And I'm kind of like, no, no. I mean, that's that's part of what's in here. And um, uh, at that level, at the level of physical law in, in this particular realm, the laws don't tell us that there's a direction of time. And that's very cool. I love that. I love that idea. And it it to me, it it uh it always resonated with um I think it's the end of the Republic, right? The myth of Ur, where the three sisters are weaving time and one spins the wheel this way and the other spins the wheel the other way, right? So time goes forward and then time goes back to the beginning and then it goes forward and then it goes back. I think there's something, I think there's something to it. I don't know how that would apply to, in a, in a more concrete way, to Mazarin's principle that by doing for the other, one does for oneself. Um, however, that is a concept that was put together with the concept of time reversal in one of the essays that Pierre Baudry wrote. So um, yeah. I so I don't really know how, you know, if you make something better in the present. Uh, the question is, how is it going to affect the past? You can see how it affects potentially the future, potentially yeah. as a better outcome. But how would it really change the past would be, if I'm going to put those concepts together, I don't know how that would work. And I may be thinking way too, in a kind of hierarchical way, that's that's not allowing me to step into how that may potentially work. Yeah, you know, it's, it, I, I think... The implications are so staggering that it's hard for me to really ponder. But if I, uh, I guess, take an extreme example, if I shoot somebody, right? I've taken away their life. I do this thing, I take away their life. You run that in reverse, and what have I done? I have raised them from the dead through this action. <laughs> so it's just, I think it's, for me, I'm just saying, it's just, it's, it's, I, I, it's just too much. It's just too much to, to ponder. Hmm. Juan, Maureen, did you did you yeah. want to ask Juan something? Oh, or? Yeah, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask Juan the second part of the question, 
was if you can take these three orders that Bohm uh, postulates, and of course he's not the only one who's postulated this. It was just interesting seeing it come from a physicist uh, that we all know. Um, but I'm interested in the possibility of how this could be placed on top of the epistemological um, journey, uh, you know, with the, with the implicate being the three lowest steps of the epistemological journey, the next three being the implicate order. And then the question comes, if you want to take the final step of the super implicate order, where that may emerge. So again, when you're dealing with Plato, in my opinion, the difficulty is that there was an initiatory aspect to being a, Plato a, a, a Platonist student at that time. So there was the external academy, which there always is, and then there was the secret academy, which there always is. And there has to be a certain level of personal growth to go from the external order of the academy, the information that has been passed on to us, and then the information that has been kept from us. So, uh, and that has to be earned, however you wanna qualify earning the esoteric or the occult hidden side of this particular journey that Plato is describing in all his writing. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted by your question because it goes perfectly with Dr. Clarage's presentation today uh, about time, because we all know that uh, Plato explained in the Timaeus that in the living universe, Time is a moving image of timelessness, okay, of, of eternity. And I am absolutely delighted too by your intuition or your insight about the correlation of the philosopher king and uh, the super implicate uh, reality, if you want. Because uh, as I often parrot myself, the difficult jump is between stage three and stage four, okay? One, sense perception, two, intellect, three, psyche, and four, the soul. However, there is another quantum leap, and that is the big one between five and six, between, if you authorize me to use the political terminology, between the aristocratic man and the philosopher king. Uh, you forced me to be a little bit uh, metaphysical today because most of the time I get rid of that question by saying that the philosopher king is only the first among equals uh, among the aristocrats, but it's not true. Uh, there is a true jump between the aristocrats or the aristocratic man because it's not hereditary nobility, but once again, it's a true inner adventure. And when you said the the secret of the account, uh, I would say the intimate adventure, okay? So you have the outside teaching, but you have the intimate uh, uh, teaching, which is only possible inside our own soul. The external academy is only an opportunity on, on an occasion. I, and I would say that the initiation is not granted by someone else. The initiation is granted by ourselves because we uh, were open to that uh, timeless uh, teaching precisely. And the super implica implicate is pre precisely what Dr. Claret said by his translation, that uh, it's the one manifesting in the many dimensions, meaning the many, okay? Because if you see reality from the sense perception, you have word one. If you see reality from the intellect, you have word two. If you have see reality from the psyche, you have word three, etc. But uh, the excellent text uh, in Latin that Dr. Claridge uh, showed us today, that at a certain time, at a certain, I don't know the exact word for that, but at a certain direct vision, okay, let's use Platonic term terminology, theoria episteme meaning direct contemplation of reality. 
what Dr. Clarus offers us today is just perfect, okay? The living one and the many manifesting in the multiple dimensions of all the perpetual existence of all now moments and of all words, okay? I'm sorry, Dr. Clarus, I changed a little bit uh, your translation, but I think that we would agree essentially. Uh, and that is the philosophy king, okay? And that's this, the super jump from five to six. And, uh, and that is precisely, um, I'm sorry, I'm again the parrot of La Rouge today, but uh, that sentence is so good, okay? I think that La Rouge was in a moment of uh, big uh, or massive epistemological overture when he, that uh, sentence came into his mind or descended into his mind. And that sentence is being is effective cause and effective cause is being or substance. He did not say being. He says substance is effective cause and effective cause is substance. And that is precisely that living one, the substance and the many manifesting the multiple dimensions of all the perpetual existence of all now's moments and in all the possible words. And that substance manifesting in the effective cause, producing a possible word. And uh, it's not a surprise for me that uh, such a distinguished physician like David Bohm uh, had that kind of insight, okay? Because uh, one of the tenets of Rising Thai Foundation precisely is that there's no separation between philosophy, science, and art. Mm -hmm all distinguished human being having achieved the epistemological journey to the aristocratic level or to the philosophical level would come forward, would offer to mankind with his own words, of course, different in the intellectual dimension, the same timeless reality and the same timeless truth. And I just want to take uh, five seconds to finish with three conceptual stuff because in Rising Tide Foundation, uh, we have uh, political pretensions. Uh, we have to distinguish between truth, which is precisely what we are discussing today with Dr. Clarage presentation, meaning that being that uh, real, inner, grounded, timeless, pure awareness. Okay, that's my long expression for that. And uh, the epistemological journey that would bring you, that we, would bring us to truth. And when you anchor in truth, you leave your time dimension reality as a play and not as uh, something, a uh, source of anxiety or of depression. And that is precisely the goal of the aristocratic or the timeless education. And the sooner you introduce the children to that timeless and aristocratic education, the less they would be victims of the different manipulations happening now politically and epistemologically. And that so that truth is that what is the most important. You have the facts, okay? The facts, uh, you measure things, you, you do experiences, you, you observe stuff, and you have the real, okay? And the real is the privilege of the ruling class. Why I make those three distinctions? Because if you have a good ruling class, so much better. But you, if you don't have, if you have a cacistocratic ruling class, they can make a real that will not bring you to truth. And that's here that the promotion of the aristocratic education is important. But I talk too much, I stop here. Thank you, Quad. That was a that was a nice little touch of mortality there. That was good. Uh, Michael, did you have a, a any any? Th I saw you, I saw at certain moments certain certain things wanted to leap yeah. out of you, but no, I don't remember right now. So let's, we can move on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh, Juan. Yeah, that was that was that was a very very thoughtful uh offering. Thank you. Um, Kelly. And I've been waiting for a while. Are you still there, Kelly? Hi. Hey. Um, uh, yeah, time. Uh, I kind of liked your um, your mouse analogy. analogy. Uh, you know, we look at a, a mouse. It's like, wow, he lives a really fast life. And 
And he's looking at us. It's like, look at those slow dinosaurs. Right. They must have such slow thoughts. And, uh, yeah, I don't really talk to that. You know, most people, you don't really talk about it. They they don't get it. But, um, yeah, I've, so I've, I find that interesting. Um, what was I going to say here? Uh, there's other things uh, I, about time. Well, the first thing comes to mind. Uh, I remember uh, like watch, watching a clock with a second hand. And uh, and then I, I get thinking about um, you know, some kind of thoughts where you can almost go into a trance. And you're looking at the clock and all of a sudden the second hand stops. Hmm. And it, it, it would freak me out so much. It's... Yes. All of a sudden, the, it would start again, and <laughs> right. I'm still not sure what's going on, uh, but yeah. I I know at the time I, I my thoughts would be uh, just going uh, like yeah I'd be doing like heavy thinking. Um, even uh, I've been with friends like at a dinner table, and you know maybe I'm not into the conversation, so I I'd, I'd start going into my own inner world. And um, and then people would say, "Kel, uh, what's going on?" Yeah. And and then I pop out. It's like, oh, I was just thinking, but to them, it was like I was in this some different world, you know. Yeah. And and me, I'm. But my perception of time actually would change, and yeah. uh, you know, and I'm not really sure what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't know that we need to know what's going on, but I love that it's a verification. It's your own personal verification that you you yeah. went a different flow of time. Mm. Uh, what one other thing? Uh, when you're uh, preoccupied, like I'm sure you experience it in your work when you you know you have a problem, but you're you're playing with the problem, and and so you have no problem with the problem. And you're as you're thinking about it, um, you're so involved in it that you look at your watch and it's you're, you're like, oh my god, it's um, I was supposed to be at a dinner party, and it's already you know pa- I'm I'm late for the dinner party already, and it's like, where did that time go? Yeah, and um, I just find that amazing. I I don't know. Uh, I don't. And you know, on the flip side of that, connected on the other side of that coin is that when we're, when we're with others, there can be a group flow of time where everyone syncs up. Uh, so musicians you know, are, are well aware of this, but I, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it, it, and I love that how there's something, there's something in, the, in that that I haven't, I'm not sure what else to say specifically right now, but there can be a group sense of time. And then there can be an individual, like you're describing, you can pop out of that and you can be there in the same room but you're no longer in the same room. <laughs> you know? and that's, uh, I love that. I'm not sure what else to say. Well, on that I, I almost can like propose a question uh, where is it possible that uh, like if we experience time, like, um, like in that fulfilling thing where we're actually busy thinking and doing some kind of productive work and our thoughts, is it, is it possible that you actually live longer because you're you're just so so busy with your thoughts? Right. You know, I and think you it's can. A, it's a, but like, I don't know if there's been studies on that or or anything yeah. like that. Uh, I, I I like a, that question. Like that elicits. Well, do you mean? Does one mean longer? on the calendar, right? Yeah. So have, have I existed more calendar days or more along the lines like you're saying when one has an inner individual sense of time, I think sometimes there can, so to speak, there can be more time compressed into those moments. And so do I live longer? Yes, but not on the calendar. Um, well, I don't know. Uh... I, I think of like a someone who's depressed, you know, and they're they're just look, you know, counting the days, and the days go on forever, and uh, and then they just waste their lives, and they're dead at, you know, thirty or forty, and yeah, I, I don't know, I I'm just kind of throwing that out there. 
Sure. No, I love it. It's a great. Yeah. No, it, yeah. it is. It is good thought. I, I think about this too a little bit. And, and it, obviously there's, there's definite um, positive effects to fighting dementia, other, other decaying processes that go on in the brain by having an active mind. Obviously, if you've got a stagnant, depressive um, dynamic that you've, you've allowed to take you over, your mind won't be very, very agile, you know, that won't contribute to longevity. But at the same time, there's brilliant minds throughout the ages who didn't live long lives either for sometimes they're snuffed out. Sometimes they died through probably natural causes at a very early age. So, you know, there's those paradoxes too. So I think the way that Michael was addressing it in terms of the quality instead of the just the the quantity of of minutes in our lives but the quality of of how that life is lived as far as redefining what time is as something more than a linear extension is a is a fruitful way of thinking about it for sure because like john keats died at 26 but the qualitative creative output that he was able to generate you could say he lived many thousands of lifetimes you know people <laughs> try their whole lives and, and then some to, uh, to produce even yeah. one great poem and he was able to do so much, yeah. you know? Right. Yep. Yep. John, you still there? I'll turn on the video. I'll turn on the uh, sound. Uh, thank you, Dr. Claridge. Very interesting. Um, I, I'm thinking about the Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in saecula saeculorum. Yeah. The erat, why erat? Why the imperfect rather than est? Yeah, you know, I don't know. So say some more about that because I'd love to hear, just, just riff on that for a little bit. Um, no, just uh, it's it's sort of like it has always been that way, and so perhaps using the imperfect was a, a better way to describe it than est gives the impression of right now. Est focuses perhaps on the nunc. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's just a, it's just a curious question. Um, it is. but at the but I. I'm focusing on the saecula saeculorum. Yeah. So that's uh, the way you translated it is in all possible worlds. Yeah, or the world or of all worlds. The world of all worlds. All right, so the possible world is a concept that we normally associate with John Dunn Scotus. It's 13th century. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the medieval scholastics. Huh, and uh, and the possible world is used in uh, modern logic, uh, modal logics, intentional logic, um, and we give a semantics with respect to a set of possible worlds. And this is used today in computer science for uh, program verification, where we consider all of the possible uh, all of all of the possible states that the program can uh, can go through, and some of them potentially are uh, fallacious or demonstrating uh, dangerous situations. But you can also, under certain conditions, zoom in or zoom out in time. So you so you you have all sorts of different notions of what what your time measurement might be. Whether are you talking about microseconds, uh, milliseconds, eons, uh, if you're working with the time dimension, but you could be working with various kinds of spatial dimensions. In computer science, of course, the values of variables become new dimensions as well. Uh, and so, so, so I, I find it fascinating that all of a sudden you can just in a single sentence describe all these different possible worlds, but also the different levels at which you could refer to time uh, and uh, not, you can naturally extend it to uh, other kinds of dimensions. Uh, it, it really does carry a lot. But, they, but this is the first time that I've got an intuition of what they mean by um, in quantum mechanics in the Copenhagen interpretation. It doesn't sound quite so absurd. Uh, uh, exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, because yeah. 
because what what you are saying is that already this was inherent in the work in the 1800s. Yes, right, right. It was introduced into the statistical gas laws by Gibbs and others. And, uh, you know, not many people talk about it because it's really mind bending. And so you just kind of do the math and then don't talk about what the math means, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, so they, I mean, this is, this is the uh, kind of ideas that I've been trying to get out uh, with the starting my blog on the history of science is that the, is that all of the debates of today have their precursors in the, uh, well, in the mechanic for the mechanics, um, 16th, 17th century, but the, you're into here, you're talking about the gases, uh, that would be 17th, 18th century, um, yeah. or even later. And also 19th, a lot of the, 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 the last rendition of the math, when, 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 it was, when it was stated that, okay, now the math is closed, I think that was 19th century, I could be wrong. But I yeah, that, that sounds right, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. so, so I mean, it's just, it's mind-opening, thanks. It is. It is that, you know, try as we might to be uh, sense-based realists who only trust, you know, what I can weigh and measure when we extend and we want to try to explain what we're seeing, we keep getting brought into these other realms. It's like, shoot, there it is again, that I must consider a collection of worlds, you know, <laughs> if, I want, if, my, if I want to have some kind of an intellectual depth to my explanation, but in in fact, uh, actually, this is this reminds me to the uh, uh, what Quan Quan always talks about the time and timelessness. But the the introduction of the calculus allow uh, allowed us to write in a single equation a changing phenomenon. So it allowed us to make static what is dynamic. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So they, so they, so that you could say that that was the beginning of this process, uh, but now we're now we're reaching far more, far greater stages. I'll leave it at that because for okay. them, it's yeah, it's just you. mind opening. Thanks. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Susan Doris, aka Mom and Grandma, are you still there? <laughs> yep, we're still here. You're still here. Hold on, right. put on the put, put on the video. Okay, so I just wanted to like in my Christian belief, right? A good and loving Creator created time for the sake of humans, for us. Mm -hmm. So that little mouse doesn't live inside of time. There's no sense of time in the little mouse, oh. but okay. we have a sense right. of time. <laughs> And I, I just, I find when I'm looking at the world, the world around me, and I'm going with C.S. Lewis's uh, comparison of God and time like a bookshelf, like God is outside of time, right? The creator lives outside of time. So he can see the past like a bookshelf. He can go. Mm -hmm. So that when I'm looking at this crazy, crazy world and I'm doing things either good or bad, right? I'm looking at it with an openness that maybe my sense of time is wrong and that there's a creator who's seeing something else. He's seeing other possibilities. And then I also wanted to ask, have you ever thought about the idea of the future changing to the past? Like I've heard a beloved friend of mine had passed away. And that morning I had my daily reading was the verse that I would need that night when I would learn that he had passed mm -hmm. away, right? So mm -hmm. you're you're finding the past and the present sometimes switching. Yeah. And I've heard, so during that time, I also heard many other cases of something from the future coming into the past. So before you need to know it, you find out things. So I'm just wondering, yeah. have you ever thought of the, the idea of future and past? Yeah. Thank you. So if you look at, um, I'm not on mute, yeah. Uh, so another another representation mm -hmm. of that word "semper" or eternity, um, right? In in the language of the word that I'm using this afternoon. So here here's my line of time, and here's this morning, 
right? And here's this evening. And that's all what the senses show me. They that they don't, you know, and I try I somehow magically travel right. along, right? Okay. So in in a more scientific language, we would say that's a line of time. Okay. In this other direction called Semper, it's a plane of time. And one is free if one is able to wander in that plane of time. And so, yeah, it's quite possible that something that on the line is yet to happen in this other dimension of time can easily come back. And there's, there's a connection between them. Uh, I mean, I've had my share of feeling the influence of what I would call the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, I'm sure it's more, more more rich and wonderful and complicated than I just presented it, but at least you know from a from a point of view of math and dimensions, bringing those to, it's like yeah, of course, of course, okay. the, the future can yeah yeah it's it's just fascinating. It's happened so many times to myself and other people. It just yeah. fascinating. Thank you. It was yeah, an amazing presentation. Welcome. Thanks. Follow up from Bruce. Dr. Claridge, all I know of you is this wonderful, thought-provoking presentation. Would you share your uh, expertise or interest in these things that equipped you to shed so much light on it? And also, do you what do you know of uh, practical science to the extent of engineering that's groundbreaking? going forward with the most current examinations of time? Mm, no, I'm not that familiar with it. Most of the science and engineering that I encounter is entirely sense-based and passing time. I really don't, you know, that's one of its, that's one of the reasons why it's stuck and it's never going to go beyond itself is uh, because it's all stuck in one dimension or even even a point it's stuck in less than one dimension so no i don't have much, i don't do you, do you do you know of any uh of uh engineering that goes into different dimensions of time i don't not that i would uh recall accurately so i'll okay. sub in another quick question <laughs> yeah based on all you have thought about and f and found about time what's your what are you, what's your best thinking about the nature of reality in terms of our eternal nature and what we might experience or what anyone experiences after we die? Boy, oh boy. Maybe we should schedule a second, <laughs> second afternoon on that question. I don't know. That's a tough one. That's that's the, the that's the mystery, huh? What, whatever it is, I don't think it'll be Michael Claridge uh, experiencing it, but I don't know. Great question. Don't know. <laughs> and uh, to, to what you opened with, I just want to make a comment on that. Um, I certainly have worked hard and, and, and studied various traditions myself. And at the same time, I've been lucky, lucky enough to have some really incredible teachers in this regard uh, pertaining to what I, I'm talking about this afternoon and other things. Uh, and so uh, in one sense, I didn't come up with this, you know, because it wasn't just me in a, in a, in a desert hut, you know, and a, and a physics textbook. That's not how this, that's not how this, this comes together for me. Is this the main, the main topics you post about on your sub stack? Oh, no, no, I got, I used to have a, uh, I used to have a Google blog. You remember the Google blogger site? So I used to have that. And then as they were tweaking with the censoring algorithms, this was like in, in 2020, I think. I, I, I posted an article on St. Paul. I had some thoughts about St. Paul and his writings. And I got I got censored because of that. And I was just like, okay, 
there has to be a better way. And that's what, so I, I, that forced me into these other, these other platforms, which luckily still one can post on. We'll see how long that lasts. So I, I, uh, I moved over to Substack. No, it's pretty wide ranging. If you if you can just scroll through my Substack post, it's pretty wide, pretty wide ranging. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, Dr. Clarge, do you have time for maybe two more questions? That should be good. Okay. Uh, Pascal, are you still there? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, one second. Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Claridge. Uh, very interesting topic today. Um, it got me thinking. I'm also a teacher, and uh, I was using an example in terms of uh, awareness with my students to try to get to them that it's really important that they listen to me <laughs> all the time uh, because uh, you know, the, the human brain is, is, uh, we're wired in a certain way that, you know, if you, if you look at different things at the same time, you're going to miss most of them. And I was using this, um, this study, the, this example that's, uh, that's showing, um, uh, basically, you know, you have two teams, uh, of players of basketball players, they're in different colors and they are passing the ball and you have to count the balls. Uh, that how many times uh, one team is passing the ball to each other. And then, uh, you know, you get to the, the actual count and everybody is super good. They, you know, they were able to count it. And so great. And then I, there's a question that's asked and, you know, basically, uh, did you see the bear, the, the moonwalking bear? And everybody's like, what? <laughs> what bear are you talking about? Yeah. And so you rewind the whole thing. And yeah, clearly there was a bear, a moonwalking bear that passed by as you were counting uh, all of these basketballs uh, being passed around. And so I, I was using that and I was thinking about this question of time. It's uh, to me that there was an analogy where, you know, when we're focused on a certain time frame or a certain speed of time, uh, whether it's individually or maybe on a larger scale, uh, sometimes, you know, we lose parts of other times as you can it kind of explain today. And to me, it's, it's, uh, it's very mind boggling, but also it's, I think that's, that's what happens with history. When we look at history, sometimes, you know, the chronology that we're using is okay to a certain extent, but then we're losing a, a different chronology, which would explain maybe a higher principle in terms of how time is created. Um, and I, 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 yeah, it's more of a comment than a question, but I, I don't, I still don't know how to really piece all of it together. Uh, but I really appreciated your, your uh, yeah. presentation for, uh, you know, throwing that uh, out there and uh, making me question even more <laughs> that, yeah. that idea. So thank you. You know, I, you're welcome. I, I spent a little time with some of these, you know, incredible historical writers like, uh, um, what was his name? The German guy who wrote The Decline of the West. Uh, anyway, and then Toynbee. But it wasn't that long ago that, that you know, some of our greatest historical thinkers were acknowledging the fact that there are cycles of civilizations and they go through the same cycles and you will have the same types of people born at the beginning of the civilization and the same types of people who are born and they care about the same things in the middle, right? And, and so this notion that time is a line uh, doesn't even play out if you if you are a serious student of history. It doesn't work. You, you can't understand history that way. Yeah. Well, I guess there's this balance too, right, between the fact that you do have things that repeat, but also things that never repeat. Like, you know, no yeah. two things are ever exactly equal. Yeah. So we, uh, <laughs> yeah. there's common principles yeah. that are expressing themselves. But I guess here's here's a question I got for you. And then and then Mar Maureen has a follow up. Um, Some might say I'm trying to think of like all possible perspectives Um, and it but some as a devil's advocate might say, well, the what you've said might apply 
or they could see it very clearly for an orbit of a of a planet or a pathway of a rock being thrown or that you know such that the whole orbit the whole pathway is defining yeah. the behavior of each of the specific moments in that that flow um yeah. or a, a light photon you know in a process um but but that might challenge the idea of free will where human beings mm. have biomechanical components electrobiomechanical components that ab- abide by these sort of laws like that that photons and gra- you know other things that that yeah non-thinking uh matter is subservient to but then we have the free will function so does that uh challenge free will in some way in your mind or what's the role and how does how does the human factor allow for the existence of free will at the same time as everything else that you just said yeah yeah so i would uh i would let's see if i can keep the same drawing or not uh and i'll draw a new one Uh, okay, so now we're going to put on. We're changing our our metaphor. We're now uh, and 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 we're going to smush our our experience of the world uh, onto a piece of paper, a la Flatland. Uh, what's the name? Abbott, something like that. Okay, so if if I uh, if I live my life, I will. Uh, I shouldn't be crossing. It doesn't cross. Um. Yeah, that there will be a trajectory that I can follow, uh, and it will never repeat exactly, as you brought up earlier, right? And yet I still seem to wake up every day, go through some usual events, uh, eat some food, uh, and then end up back in the same bed. Occasionally, I'll take a few days, and I'll go to another place, and I go to a different bed, and I come back to this one. And then maybe I move, I reach a certain age and I move over here, or whatever, like that. And so there is a little wiggle room that I can change. Like I want, I don't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat more vegetables going forward, you know, and I have that willpower. I'm gonna eat more vegetables, less meat, or whatever it is, right? And I can actually do that, right? But in terms of like the trajectory I'm on. I've just like, instead of going there, I've gone there. Okay, and now I'll be on a slightly different path, but I will never get off of of this. I won't. Uh, So you can say, is that free will? You can say, well, yeah, but no, right? Uh, And what kind of a will would it take? What kind of a will would it take to get off of that entirely and go to a different uh, a different life. Like we don't have that will, not, not as we are. We don't have that developed yet. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's sort of, I guess, getting at the question of, of identity in some ways, or like I was thinking to myself, like what are all of the pathways I could have been on, you know, if I'd made dumber choices in my life earlier on? or maybe yeah. smarter choices in my life earlier on right, that would right. have resulted in me um n- not not tapping into my potential or be or having better access to tapping into my potential earlier on you know uh whatever the case may be so there's like there's that factor that i i certainly know that i'm the consequence of my decisions i didn't have to make the decisions that i did for good or for bad but i did i made them but um but i could imagine having not made them you know and uh yeah. there's that I guess that's sort of what you're getting at there too, regarding the the different pathways or or transformations um, of an identity, um, from being like a tragic identity to a non tragic identity, or going from a tra- a non tragic identity to somebody who is mm-hmm. less than they could be, or something. Well, you know, I was just talking with my friends earlier today about along those lines that, like, for me, the way I experience it is, I will sometimes see somebody who's in a bad, bad, bad off, or it seems to me bad off on the streets, a little crazy, you know, clearly that has been there for years. And it's not all people like that, but sometimes I will see a particular kind of person like that. And I can, I can, I know that I could have, I could have ended up like that, or, or maybe I still will, whatever. It's like, I know I might, I could have ended up like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's still bringing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's all hug each other and stop fighting. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we let's let's do two more. So we got uh, Quan, we got uh, Maureen, and then we'll we'll round it out. So okay. uh, Maureen, I know you've been waiting. So for that follow up, I was just going to throw this out as kind of fun, Michael. Um, if we could begin to get a little bit more of an intuitive or visceral sense of the play of time, or maybe the reality of time by looking at some M.C. Escher. And hmm. by that, I would suggest one of the clearest possibilities, and this may even talk to the uh, universal time reversal function, would be all his staircases that he does. So if you look at those uh, as key to understanding, in some sense, beginning to intuit a different sense of time you know as an experience a little bit different than most experience how we would define most experiences which are pretty low level our sensory experience of most things pretty not too sophisticated but if you look at that particular thing now there are mathematical components to mc escher's work but uh if you look at those pictures there is a visceral uh, opening that happens um, just like if you look at certain of his pictures there's the field of self-referencing which he puts into pictures where he sees himself looking at himself so it it does um, it may help defining time which we could say in a certain sense doesn't even exist um, in, in a way uh, it may help the the quality of our understanding of what that might be. Yeah, I like that. I think it's a great connection. I don't have much more to say, but it's got my mind thinking. I think that's a really good that's a really good connection. The other thing I just wanted to make, which I was not going to say, but you you raised it in your diagram there, like how do we go to another spot? So I would throw a postulate that we live in a vast soup right so the possibility of going from one space to another space which we think is our personal will or lack of will may actually not be that at all we may adjust to cosmic components or galactic components i guess as einstein would put it that have a kind of implicate order to them and all of that is, we are affected by all of that. It's a kind of one from the one to the many. So we experience that kind of implicate order. And we may assume that the experience that we have is determined by our own will. When in point of fact, what we may be experiencing as our own will is the experience of the effect of the one manifested on the many. Yeah, I would certainly say that's pretty common or uh, uh, accurate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good thought, uh, Doctor Le Kwan, Are you there? Yeah, uh, I I'm very excited by the exchange that you had with the uh, Mac with Doctor Clarage on the uh, tragic reality of our lives. And I think that we are condemned any way to be free, okay? And the experience that I have with the many of my patients when I was working at the hospital, that sometimes because of some regrettable decision they did not take or they did take during their youth, they ended up, let's say, in a not very desirable social, social situation. But paradoxically, sometimes when the door for, let's say, social improvement is quite closed for certain people, it would push them to higher dimensions in my understanding. Yeah. And maybe it's a blessing in disguise because, yeah. of course, all of us want a minimum of... Uh, let's say material comfort and so on. Yeah. But when you're reduced to a minimum on yeah. that dimension, yeah. 
Uh, in some blessed people, I think it was the manifestation of the universe forcing them to mm. live at the higher dimensions. And I cannot resist to think to the epistemological journey as proposed by Plato or other philosophers. Uh, I mention often Plato because uh, I'm familiar of, with his work, but the idea is that sometimes destiny will give you a helping hand and it doesn't look like that, but it is a helping hand for you to live at the higher dimension. Yeah. And you, uh, for the people having listened to me in the past, they know that I like fancy words, but I would like to finish with something that is not a fancy word. I often talk of uh, tempus, ky kairos, and chronos, or if you want, the Latin equivalent would be gloria patria filio e spiritu santo, yeah. or santo. But I would like to offer Bob, B-O-B, -B, okay? Bob, B for being, O for epistemological overture, and B for becoming. So it's much easier to think about Bob than to think about Tampus, Kairos, and Kronos, or Gloria, Patri, and Fidio, and Spiritu Santo. <laughs> oh, God, do we have to end on that? Okay. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> Bob. End on Bob. <laughs> So we're, uh, just just to be quick, quad, uh, just to dr drill that in my head, uh, be being epistemological overture and becoming is that is that what yeah. you said? Okay, that's <laughs> yes. fun. B that's a fun idea. B O B, Bob. <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, since we have epis we in the epistemological warfare, and we want to open it uh, as to as many people as possible, I think that Bob has a greater future than Tampus, Kairos, and Kronos. <laughs> Oh maybe, boy! Maybe well, you well. know, I could see it in cartoon in manga book cartoon form. You could, you could probably pull it off. <laughs> I actually want to go back to what you started with. The first thing you said about, um, you know, this right. We 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 none of us wants to end up on the streets with our life destroyed, and yet you you have this personal experience of seeing for some people it uh, it allows them or catapults them or something, and they end up you know, at a, in a very different place. And so, I mean, I, I think a lot of us, if you, ponder, I, when I, when I pondered, I, I certainly feel like, well, can't I change without all that bad stuff happening? Isn't there some way, you know, it's, I feel myself kind of squirming, right? I kind of, well, but maybe, maybe that doesn't have to happen to me, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, tr a fact that you're bringing up. Yeah. It's like something if, if someone loses uh, his two legs uh, suddenly, okay? Uh, either that pe person can go in deep depression and mm -hmm. uh, complain for the rest of his life, which is a very human reaction, and I yeah. would not bash uh, the person for having that very human yeah. reaction. Yeah. But uh, maybe it's a closure of the existential possibilities to open something much higher. Mm. Yeah, uh, and uh, you're right for saying that you're we not obliged to have a lot of shit to improve or to evolve. I agree with that. Okay, it's maybe uh, yeah. there are nicer and softer way to evolve. <laughs> uh, but sometimes uh, uh, the fact to be in shitty situations can be truly a big epistemological overture and mm. uh, I think that uh, since there are more problems on this earth than uh, joy maybe the aristocratic attitude of enthusiasm can come from wealth power and splendor or it can come also from squalor mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. what you uh, what you just said reminded me a little bit of the whole Leibniz Voltaire um two like a two different paradigms represented by these two very influential figures in our in our recent history and a lot of people don't like Leibniz the the great scientist statesman um and you know he because he they say oh he was naive he was a, mm -hmm. a utopian fool because he believed we live in the best of all possible worlds of all imaginable of, of all possible worlds one could possibly imagine we live in this one and People would say, oh, but because 
I could imagine a better world. And because there is evil and injustice, you're a fool and an idiot. And these are often people who are, are have read Voltaire's Candide, where okay. you know Voltaire took some shots at at this uh, parody of a Leibnizian character who bad things yeah. keep happening to him, and he like gets his legs chopped off, and his family members die, and all this, these terrible things, and he's just like so goofily looking with starry eyed, lazy optimism into the future, saying this is the best of all possible worlds. Yeah. And it's like clearly, clearly, this guy is um, insane. <laughs> But it doesn't mean that it's not true that we live in the best of all possible worlds either. It just means Voltaire is a cynic. <laughs> and yeah. and if you really like use that paradigm, you'll tend to become more of a, a realistic victim or at least a cynic yourself when bad things happen to you. You won't look for the lesson you could learn that would make you a better person and, and transform mm -hmm. in a better way. Okay, um, I see why you're bringing it up now. Okay, yeah, versus like the Leibniz type saying. of perspective, you're always kind of looking for. Like his point is, it's the best of all possible worlds because we have the the ability to make it better. That's why it's the yeah. best because it is yeah. it is it is bad, and because evil can't exist means that we can act according to justice to try to you know right yeah. or wrong, and because we have that ability, then that's why we're the living proof that it's that that's true. Yeah. 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 So. But the idea of the best of the possible worlds can also be underst uh, understood if you're looking at the physical universe. Oh, from a matter of pure physics is, by uh, itself. It, it is a, uh, it's a perpetual motion machine. Uh, and we know that mechanical machines cannot be perpetual motions, but there's something special about the universe that's not just a mechanical device. Mm. So the, the point is, it can be understood in more than just moral terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, you okay. can approach it from. We wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, guys. This was great. This was good. Good Very soul good. food, Michael. Always, you always go above and beyond <laughs> every time you deliver a presentation. This just fuel. It's the gift that keeps on giving. So thank you, thank you mm -hmm. so much for introducing these concepts to us. And starting this and the, keeping the fuel on this on this conversation that's going to keep going, I'm sure, in people's internal dialogues and in their lives after this. Um, so next next week, we're going to have a presentation on uh, energy uh, with uh, Fox Green from the Space Commune. We should do something pretty interesting on that. Um, so uh, I'll we'll be sending out the invitation to the Rising Tide Foundation lecture for next week. Dr. Claridge, anybody who need well for anybody who wants to follow Dr. Claridge's writings on his uh, Substack that is in the chat box and also in the dis in the description box of this video. Right. So I highly recommend people subscribe and follow that work um, as much as possible. Um, Dr. Claridge, thank you once more for do for You're giving so your time welcome. this Sunday. Thank right. you so much, thank Dr. You, Claridge. You're welcome. Bye. Thank everybody. you. Thank Bye. you.